Welcome to Inside Church. We trust that the Lord would minister to your heart and that faith would be built as you listen to the message. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for such a warm welcome. I am so excited to be back here with you again as evidence for me hijacking Joshua's introduction. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Can you put your hands together for pastors uh, Craig and Pastor Janet Watson? And also Joshua, the Watson family, I honor you all, and I thank God for just your diligence, your sacrifice, and also Pastors Dave and, and Sandy, thank you all so much. You know, as, as our elders in the ministry, as our forerunners, we're here because of you. We stand on your shoulders because of your sacrifices that you've made. And you've allowed us to come to this place where we can further the gospel. And so, you know, I thank you all. I honor you all. And God bless you all. May God continue to give you many years of longevity and strong ministry as you raise up the next generation. Let's put our hands together for them. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to Josh for continuing to invite me back year after year. Thank you so much. Uh, team, thank you all so much. You've done a fantastic job. You can be released to wherever you go, behind the curtain or down here. You've done a fantastic job. Great to see you again, Caleb. Nice to see that the skills are still strong. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun here tonight. And uh, there's nothing better than being in the Word. We can have fun in the Word, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're family. And... Um, and I think Joshua prepped you and reminded you of the video that I recorded as a greeting to you to bring a friend and bring an expectation, right? How many of y'all brought a friend? Thank you all for the eight people who are obedient. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you all being here, whether you're young or young at heart. It uh, doesn't matter. The Bible applies for all of us. Amen. But I know it is young adult night. Can my young adults make some noise? Y'all are exciting. So you saw up there uh, my youngest child, who is Lily. She's my only daughter. And she just celebrated a birthday toward the beginning of the month. She actually turned 13 years old. I can't believe it. My youngest child is 13. Where does the time go? My God. Like, I just remember when I was graduating college and even high school at that. It goes fast, huh? But, um, but she's 13 now, and I remember when she was a baby, and I remember holding her in my arms. I remember changing her diapers, and some of you all have kids. You know what that's like. Others of you all who are still younger, maybe, you know, you babysit or have younger siblings or nieces or nephews. How many of y'all have changed a diaper before? All right. For half of you all, guess what? You have a wonderful experience awaiting you. And so I remember changing her diapers, but they grow so fast. And when she was a baby, like many things that babies have in common, she always wanted to put things in her mouth, whether they were edible or not edible. And it didn't matter. She didn't discriminate. If she could get her hands on it, she would want to put it in her mouth, where all my parents at. They're saying amen. And so you have to really be careful what they have contact with, what's within their reach. Because if it's within their reach, it's probably going in their mouth, right? Because we know as good parents, we want to protect our kids. And not everything that can fit in the mouth is fit for consumption. There are some things that are dangerous, right? Could be filled with you know, germs or could be sharp or really just dangerous or could you know, get lodged in the throat. And so we're really careful about what goes into our baby's mouths. And I believe God, as a good father, he's equally as concerned about what's happening in our mouths. But I'm not talking about what's going into our mouth as far as like eating, that dieting, that's another message. I'm not preaching that message here today. But he's concerned about what's coming out of our mouths, the words that we're using. He's really interested in it. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks a lot about the words that we choose to speak. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23, and I'll pray in just a moment. It says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. That's good news for a lot of us. Another scripture says in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 14 in the New International Version, it says this. 
I know I'm working you guys pretty quickly. It says, from the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things. So we're being kept out of trouble. We're filled with good things through what's coming out of our mouths. However, it's not always good things that are coming out of our mouths. Sometimes there might be negative things that are coming out of our mouths, or we're tempted to say negative things. As a matter of fact, James says in James chapter 3, verse 6 through 8 in the NIV, and I'll just paraphrase, it says, the tongue is also a fire, and no human being can tame the tongue. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is the power of our words. I want to talk to you from the subject titled, Words Are Creative Superpower. Words are creative superpower. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to receive of your word. We receive it with gladness. Lord, I ask that you would think through my mind and speak through my lips, that this word of God would come out unhindered and unchecked by any outside force, that the seed of this word of God would go into every heart and bear forth much good fruit. Now, Lord, I decrease that you increase. I step back that you step forward, and we decree and declare signs, wonders, and miracles in confirmation of the word preached. Holy Spirit, we don't just invite you into the room. We give you the room to have your way in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, if you agree, say amen. amen. Now, I want to invite you to take some good notes tonight. If you have your Bibles, make sure you're turning with me. If you have your paper Bible, great. If you have your digital Bible, that's cool too. If you don't have a Bible, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> okay, I have grace for you. I love you. But make sure you have your Bible. That's really important. Take some notes because I like to say that revelation goes just as quickly as it comes. And so you have to catch it. Say catch it. Yes. You got to catch it. And so there might be something that I say that the Holy Spirit has given me for you today. Or as I'm simultaneously talking, the Holy Spirit might give you something and customize wisdom for you for your situation and for your life, for your betterment. However, it does you no good if you go home, wake up tomorrow morning and be like, what did he say? He said that one thing. I just can't remember what it is. It was pretty good. Maybe I can call my friend. Oh, she's not picking up. Ah, oh, well. Well, this word, I believe, has the power to transform. And so we want to treat it as such. Now, you guys don't have to be quiet. We're young adults, right? I say we. I'm still a young adult. <laughs> I got all them kids. I'm still a young adult. But you can talk back to me. I love you all having a response. You can talk back to me. That's fine. We'll have a great time tonight. There's a saying that says, with great power comes what? Do you know? Great responsibility. You've heard it before. With great power comes great responsibility. We have a responsibility with what we speak. Now, Satan is very crafty. He'll try to induce us, encourage us, deceive us to try to say negative things, right? He might try to trick us through our favorite song saying these different things in their lyrics that we would never want to pop up in our lives, yet we're walking around the house singing it over and over and over. Oh, is that not you? That you did that? That's not you. you, not you guys. Some of y'all are looking at me like, what is he talking about? I only sing praise and worship music all the time. But that's how it works, right? Or maybe the enemy might throw thoughts in our mind to try to um, persuade us or tempt us to say something negative about something or about someone. But ultimately, it's all for the goal of getting you to agree with him so he can work destructively in your life to stop the plan of God. But God wants you to use your words for something positive, faith-filled words, to build things up, to build you up. And you might hear this today, and this might be the first time you're ever hearing something like this. You say, well, how can something such as words that can't even be seen, how can they be so powerful? How can they have so much power or so much authority? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 63, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus says his words are spirit. But notice this, that words, they're invisible. You can't see them. But yet, they're powerful. And there's something that my dad has been preaching about for the last maybe year and a half. 
and he calls it 4D. Now, you all have heard of 3D. We, you know, we can see things in 3D. This, this podium, this is 3D. I can touch it. I can see it. But he talks about 4D because 3D is this reality that we live in, right? But 4D is the spiritual realm. It's the unseen realm. That things are happening in an unseen realm that unless they are happening in the unseen realm, the fruit or the result of it in a 3D realm cannot exist. So there's things happening in a realm that we cannot see naturally. We cannot taste it. We can't smell it. We can't touch it. We can't look at it. But yet it exists. And yet spiritually, because it's so important and it supports what's happening in the 3D realm, it becomes more important, more real than what's happening here. Let's prove that biblically. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18 in the NIV, it says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So the spirit realm is an eternal realm. This is all temporary. Each of us, one day we're going to go home to be with the Lord. This is a temporary experience. I like what one man says, you're not a natural man having a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual man having a temporary natural experience. Because when you leave this earth, your spirit will live on for all of eternity. And if you're born again and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you will go to heaven and be with the Father forever. I'm going to pause right here and say this. If you're an unbeliever and you've never given your life over to Jesus Christ, you'll be able to do so tonight. And I want to remind you that it's not good people that go to heaven. It's not bad people that get sent to hell. It's forgiven people who receive forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ in their heart. Those are the people who get a chance to be with God for all of eternity. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for that. That's good news. But these words that we speak, words are important. And this is important because words are authorization for spiritual forces to work either for us or against us. I'm going to say that again. That's good to write down. Words are spiritual forces or the authorization for spiritual forces to work either for us or against us. There's an important scripture that we'll go to, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. You might have read this scripture before or heard it before. But it talks about, once again, how important the power of words are. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Uh, it says this, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Or eat what it produces. Let me read out of the Passion Translation. It says, Your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life, and the talkative person will reap the consequences. So if you're writing notes, write this down. God has given us the ability to legislate our future with our words. God has given us the ability to legislate our future with our words. Our words create the life we live. Our words create the life we live. In life, you will either rise or fall to the level of your speech. You will either rise or fall to the level of your speech. Your words are authorization for God to move on your behalf and in your life. Your words also become the limitation for God to not be able to move because you haven't given proper authorization. Let's keep going. I think I have your attention now. Let's, let's show this in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Let's go all the way to the beginning, because I think there's a concept about words that I think we would be enlightened to understand. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. It says this. Then God said, 
let there be light, and there was light. Pretty simple. God said, and then there was. Verse 6. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, Genesis 1, 6. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And then we saw, so it was. In verse 9. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. I think we're starting to see a pattern. God said, and he saw it, and it was done. God said, and it was done. God said, it was done. Ten times in this chapter of Genesis chapter 1, which the word Genesis means the beginning, we see God said, and something happened. As a matter of fact, in verse 31, The Bible says, then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I believe it was good because it was done by faith. But the Bible says in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God formed man from the dust of the ground and he became a living being, one translation says, God made man and man became a speaking spirit like God. Notice what's happening, that God made man in his image and in his likeness. And what was God doing? Was God communicating a message to someone? Well, man had not been formed yet when everything else was being formed. Maybe he was trying to send a text message to somebody. No, no, no. That doesn't seem like that was the primary reason that God was speaking. Why was God speaking? Well, he had to create. So it tells me that the primary reason originally for communication wasn't just communication. But when you speak these words, the primary reason for the words were creation. It wasn't communication. The primary reason for words first was creation, then communication. This is what the Word says. This is what we can extract from this. Words were originally meant for creation before communication. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says this. Hebrews 11, 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the words of God, so that the things which are seen were not made from things that are visible. It didn't say that the world was made from nothing. It said that the world was made by things not seen, by things that were not visible. You know what's not visible? Your words. So once again, we have confirmation that the world was framed by the words that God said. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 in the Passion Translation, it says, The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature, His mirror image, He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. So God spoke creation into manifestation. Now, if we're made like him in his image, in his likeness, form and function, then I would submit to you that we are created to create with our words. Communication does happen. True enough, we communicate with what we say. But the primary reason was to create the world that we live in. Could it be that we might have not known that the life that we're living has been inadvertently created or even accidentally created because we didn't know by what we were saying, what we were releasing out of our mouths, what we were giving spiritual forces, forces license to do? So what we learn from the scriptures is that you have to say it before you see it manifested. I'll say this. I want you to write it down or type it. To change your world, you are obligated to change your words. To change your world, you are obligated to change your words. Not just your life, but maybe your family. What about your school? What about your university? What about your business? What about your neighborhood? What about Durban? What about your government? Come on, elections we got coming up next month. And what the enemy wants to convince you to do is that to use your words to partner with his agenda because he tries to tell you that your words don't have much meaning. They're just words. 
and my words, why would they have so much significance over my entire neighborhood? But words have creative power, right? Amen? Amen. There's a scripture that says in uh, Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I like to say it like this. Faith comes by hearing, but faith is activated by saying. Faith comes by hearing, but faith is activated or it's released by saying. So I like to do illustrations. I feel like illustrations really help us. I feel like Jesus, because, you know, he used a lot of parables and stuff to really help people connect with what he was trying to say. So I like to do illustrations. So today is no different. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Pastor Josh. And so I have these uh, containers. My team was so wonderful to get the containers. Thank you so much, Pastor Teresa, Pastor Lenora, and all the BWM staff that came out to support. Thank you all so much. They do a fantastic job. Put your hands together for them. And those who also volunteer and partner with us, thank you, Grant and Tennessee, I appreciate you all. Okay, um, so I'll start, let's see, I'll start here. All right, so I have this container. I want you to write this down if you're writing notes, type it if you're typing notes. Words are containers holding an image meant to be expressed in the earth. Words are simply containers holding an image meant to be expressed in the earth. We can also say meant to be expressed in your life, meant to be expressed in your environment. But the main part I want you to get is words are containers. They hold something, and when you speak them, it, that container is there, and then it gets released. So I have something that says health words. So let's say uh, a person is having some health challenges. And maybe they went to the doctor, they got a bad doctor's report, maybe they've been dealing with some aches and pains, sicknesses, whatever is happening, maybe they're fearful, things run in their family, whatever is happening. But what God's word says, what the promise is, is by his stripes you are healed. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, if you want to write the reference down, it says that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So I remember when I was growing up, growing up in a faith household, similar to the Watson household. So I'm growing up in a faith household, and I remember when I wasn't feeling well, and I would ask dad or ask mom, you know, do they have something to help me feel a little better? Some aspirin, some, some kind of medicine, you know, and, and I feel like that was a, just an innocent request, right? But dad, he's a faith man. And he believes in this promise. And so what he would do is he would say, well, come in here, son. Let me pray for you. I was like, okay, yeah, pray for me. And so he would pray for me. And then he would say, let me give you a prescription. Let me give you something to help you. I would say, yeah, that sounds good. What you got? And he would say, I don't have any medicine, but I do have the gospel. <laughs> see, what, see what he did there? And so he said, I want you to repeat Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, seven times, three times a day. And take that. Take it three times a day. Just like a prescription. And I'd be like, well, Dad, I mean, can a brother get some ibuprofen or something? <laughs> but I would do it, right? I would do it. And notice, I would feel my body getting better. Now, some may say, well, no, maybe that's just psychological. Maybe that's just kind of a placebo effect. But let me tell you, it didn't work only one time. It worked all while I was growing up because we didn't keep any medicine in the house. It wasn't until I left home that I, like, discovered the world of medicine. <laughs> it's big business. I was like, there's many medicines here. Why would they keep this from me? But they taught me a better way a higher system. So let's say, you know, you're in one of those categories or a person's in those categories. And um, I think I have the wrong things. Oh, thanks. And so a person's in those categories. And so what they're doing is they're confessing the word of God over their health. So no matter what your body feels like, by his stripes, I am healed. 
Wake up the next day, don't feel so good. By his stripes, I am healed. Wake up the next day, by his stripes, I am healed. Decide to go to the doctor. The doctor gives a bad report. By his stripes, I am healed. Start talking to your mom, and your mom ain't saved, and she ain't got no faith. And she's saying, well, you know, it runs in our family. You say, you know what? I'm born again. I'm in a new family. It doesn't run in this body. By his stripes, I am healed. Now, maybe some of you all feel like I'm being a bit extra. Maybe it feels like maybe that's a bit radical. But here's what happens in life. So we're making these declarations. Somebody's confessing this, and these are the words they're letting out of their mouth. They're coming out of the container, and so you're going through life. So let's go to this next week, where what happens is your spirit starts to bring to pass what you have said. It starts to manifest in your life what you have released out of those containers. And so maybe you get an invitation to go to a healing service. There's an old friend that just happens to see you in in the shopping market, see you at Woolworths, and say, hey, I'm going to a healing service, you know, next weekend. Would you like to come with me? You say, okay, sounds great. You go there, the healing anointing of God is happening. He's calling people to the altar, but you're like, well, I don't know, maybe I should go to the altar, maybe I shouldn't. But then he starts getting a word of knowledge and talks about your direct issue. And in that moment, you start feeling warmth going through your body, and you're just sensing your body like, wow, I feel better, I feel different, I feel healed. You go back to the, next, to the doctor the next week, and they confirm you've been healed. Now, that didn't just happen. You didn't just happen to get invited to that healing service. Your spirit was seeking out how to bring the words that you spoke to pass. See, what happens sometimes as believers is We have faith, but we stop our faith effectiveness because we're not releasing the right words. So let's keep going. So another scenario. Let's say you watched a Netflix documentary. You're flipping on Netflix, and you just happen to come across this Netflix documentary about good sleeping habits. Now, you know you're not getting enough sleep, but this reinforces the fact that things are happening in your body, maybe because you're not getting enough sleep. And what happens? You start going to bed earlier. Maybe that's a word for some of y'all. You start going to bed earlier, and you notice that your body starts feeling better over the next few days. Now, This might seem like, oh, very coincidental. This is very natural. I'm telling you, this is how words work when you're releasing words of divine health over your body. So let's keep going. Maybe you get an invite to what we have in Chicago at our church. It's called the Kingdom Running Club. And so we train people how to run marathons. This is a really original name, right? (laughs) Kingdom Running Club. We're running for Jesus. They train people how to run marathons who have never like run around the block. Very impressive. In the midst of this though, they end up getting healed of a lot of different things in their bodies. They teach them about nutrition. They teach them about exercise. We've seen people get healed of bags full of medicines, prescriptions. And let's say you just happen to get an invite to this. Maybe a a relative reaches out and says, hey, this thing is happening at our church. Maybe you should join me. And you're like, look, I don't run, not for leisure. But yet, the Holy Spirit says you should get involved. And once again, you see your health improve, right? Because supernatural healing absolutely can hit your body. Yes, we believe in the power of God. But that's not the only way that God can improve your health. Because sometimes if God doesn't teach you how to keep good health, you'll lose it again by bad decisions. Or you'll invite it again by speaking the wrong thing. I think you guys get the point, but maybe you get introduced to new supplements. Oh, that's great. Or maybe you just see and feel your health improving. God has been healing you. Or we could say you sense that you should stop eating specific foods. Hey, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, right? He'll speak to you about your diet. Some of y'all are looking at me like... He's never spoken to me about my diet. Guess what, sweetie? This might be the week now that you've heard me say it. And so he'll speak to you about eating specific foods or not eating specific foods. Let me tell you, 
The Holy Spirit was really specific to me about my diet and what I was putting in my body, especially during COVID. And I maintained good health. There was people around me that were getting like really sick and stuff. And I said, nope, that's not my portion. I don't have to participate. And because I kept saying, I don't get sick. I never get sick. Not because I'm trying to be prideful or, or not out of some arrogance. I'm saying I'm putting pressure on the covenant to say that, God, you will keep me in good and divine health. No matter what plague is out here, no plague shall come nigh me. That's what the Bible says. Divine health is my portion. And so because I'm releasing these words out, the Holy Spirit is helping me to stay in line with my confession. Now, let's use the same principle with wealth. It says in Psalms chapter 115, verse 14, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. That's good news, right? Let's say it together. Let's say, say it repeated after me. The Lord will increase me, the Lord will increase me. More, and more. more and more, me and my children. And my children. One more time. The Lord will increase me, increase me. More, and more. more and more, me and my children. There might be somebody in here, you need to say that like every day for the next month. Actually, as a matter of fact, I challenge you. Say that every day for the next 30 days and just see what happens. Just, just, we'll just try it out. We'll just see. I mean, you're going to talk anyway, so might as well say the right thing. And so no matter what the bills are, no matter what the need is, no matter how big maybe the gap is from my need and my resources, no matter what the bank account says, I'm going to say that the Lord shall increase me more and more, Amen. me and my children. And now because I'm saying that, look at the principle that is now in effect. I'm going through life, and the next several weeks, I come across a series of things that happen in my life. Did they just happen? No, I don't think they just happened. Maybe a wealth-creating idea or opportunity comes my way. Maybe I get a dream about starting a, a new business. I've never had a dream about starting a business. God all of a sudden kind of downloads something to me while I'm sleeping. Check this out. The next day, I get up, I go to the gym because we're healthy, and we go to the gym, <laughs> and we work out. And I see this old friend from college, haven't seen them in eight years. They say, yeah, I'm leaving my job uh, next month. I'm starting my own company. You say, oh, that's great. In what industry? And they tell you about it. It exactly aligns with exactly what you saw in your dream. And then they say, I'm looking for a partner. Wow. And then they say, well, you say, well, yeah, man, I, don't, I don't have like a lot of resources. And they say, no, actually, we have all the funding. I just need somebody else who's sharp, who's wise, who has some knack for business. I need somebody like you to help me out. Did that just happen? No, that doesn't just happen. Let's keep going. Another illustration or example. Maybe you have Pastor Craig or Pastor Janet or Pastor Josh. I love saying that because my son's name is Josh. It's like maybe I'm speaking it into the atmosphere. And so maybe God starts working on their heart and moving on their heart to teach on a financial series, right? Or maybe, this is one of our favorites, right? <laughs> Unexpected income. Yeah. Got the 200 ran. Oh, yes, Lord. <laughs> Unexpected income. Unexpected bonuses, unexpected raises, rebates, uh, unexpected things. You know, your aunt left you some money. He says, it's not even my birthday, auntie. But she says, well, I just love you. He said, well, thank you so much. I love you too. <laughs> Promotion. What if you had your manager call you in the office and say, hey, there's a promotion or, or there's a, a job opening here at our company for actually a position that's a little higher than my position. And the person is leaving very soon. And I think you'd be good for the job. And you say, well, that sounds great. Like, what do I do? How do I apply? Who should I meet with? And then they say, well, actually, you already have the job. All you have to do is accept. But that doesn't just happen. Because when you're speaking words of faith, lining up with God's word, he will whisper your name into people's ears. 
They will be gravitating toward you or drawn toward you, and they couldn't even articulate why. It doesn't just happen, though. You put that thing in the environment. You put it in the atmosphere. You spoke words of faith that align with the Word of God and God's will for your life. And he performed what he said he would perform. And last but not least, maybe God moves on your heart to sow a seed. Sowing a seed is God's way to meet your need. Sowing a seed is God's way that he increases you. There was several years ago that God spoke to my heart, and he said, David, I want to bless you with more. And you know what I said, Caleb? That sounds like God. God, that sounds like you. Absolutely. For sure. Come on, bring it on. And you know the next set of instructions he gave me? He said, okay, I need you to sow more. I need you to give more. In order for me to get more to you, I need you to sow more seed. And it makes sense, right? To get more harvest, you got to sow more seed. You want more tomatoes, you got to plant more tomato seeds. So a lot of times when God is trying to increase you, he's not just trying to get you to hit the lottery. He's going to prompt you and provoke you to sow more seed. Can I get an amen on that? And last but not least, so unfortunately, this works the other way too. This works in the negative. So let's say somebody's saying some negative words, saying that their feet are killing them. Now, I know what you might think. Okay, Pastor David, just a figure of speech. I get it. But no, 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 not so fast. Because in the spirit realm, there is no distinguishing or differentiation between literal and figurative. There's no, oh, no, no, I, I meant, I meant. <laughs> no, 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 no. God is waiting on your authorization, and so is the enemy. So let's say this is somebody's favorite just phrase. You know, it's not literal, just figurative phrase, but that's what they say. And maybe, you know, they're having to stand up for a long time for whatever reason. Maybe they, you know, work a job where they have to be on their feet all the time. Always telling their coworker that their feet are killing them. Now, that's a terrible thing to say. Now, somebody who doesn't understand this principle might say it over and over again and not think anything of it. However, as the weeks go by, let's find out what is the image that's being expressed in their life. They start experiencing foot issues causing a lack of mobility. They've never had foot issues before, but all of a sudden they're starting to feel foot issues and they can't understand why. They go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you got bone spurs. You say, what the heck are bone spurs? <laughs> like, how, how, do you, how do you get those? Like, what's going on? And they explain, well, you know, you could live with it, or you can have surgery, but, you know, it's painful. And you're like, man, I don't want to spend money for surgery. I don't know what's going on. And so now you're feeling frustrated. And now there's some swelling that starts to happen in the foot. And maybe they're saying that, hey, it's maybe possibly gout from diabetes. Now, what I'm trying to express to you is that this stuff doesn't just happen. And so this person is saying this over and over again. And there's actually a scripture in Proverbs, I believe Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 2. It says that we are snared by the words of our mouth. That means we're trapped by the words of our mouth. And so, you know, in Chicago, it gets really cold, like cold, cold, like negative 20 degrees Celsius cold. That's what it was this past winter. Yep. And so let's say it was snowing. She's outside. She's shoveling this snow. And she should have gone back inside to warm up. But she's like, no, I'm just going to push through. And what happens? Frostbite hits some of the toes. Maybe they say, I don't know if we're going to be able to save these toes, because unfortunately, when frostbite sets in, sometimes they end up having to amputate that, you know, body part. And last but not least, maybe tripping down the stairs. Now you say, well, that's just accidental. That's just coincidental. Well, if a person's saying their feet are killing them, 
then their feet are going to be used as agents for their destruction. <laughs> Notice how this works even against their conscious will to be well. Their desire is to be well, but their speech doesn't allow their life to match up with their desire. And that's why I'm here today, because I want to make sure that that is not your case, that you're speaking God's word and decreeing and declaring what God says over your life. So write this down if you're writing notes. Words allow our spirits to look for solutions that line up with our declarations. Words allow our spirits to look for solutions that line up with our declarations. I'll tell um, a story. So there's a, a gentleman, a, a man of God, who actually just unfortunately went on to be with the Lord. It's a great thing to go on to be with the Lord, but it was a little bit sudden. Uh, Brother Jerry Savell, um, who's been preaching worldwide ministry for many years, served uh, under and with uh, Brother Copeland for many, many years, and uh, went on to be with the Lord this week. And some years ago, he was teaching at a meeting, at a believer's convention. And he asked the host, he said, hey, uh, who's preaching after me? And he said, Charles Capps is preaching after you. And he said, okay, well, I think I'll just take his time too. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. <laughs> and he laughed it off. Just a joke, right? Just joking, just playing. So he's preaching, 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 preaching. Looked at his watch, good, I got time. Preaching, 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 looked at the watch. Okay, good, I got time. Preaching, 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 looked at the watch one more time. I said, what? wait a minute. I, I, I think my watch has stopped. I don't think the time has moved for a while. And he said, do you, do you have the time? What time is it? And he said, you've exactly taken your time and Brother Charles Capps' time as well. And Brother Charles Capps came up and said, I just want to say one thing. I don't need to preach. I just need, need to say one thing. Brother Jerry has trained his spirit to the point where it will bring to pass whatever he says, even if he's just joking. I want you to catch the revelation. His words stopped his watch. Let's look a little deeper. His words stopped time. Because your words were meant to be creative and dominate in this 3D arena. And if the words are spirit, that means that they have a higher authority than just what we see in the 3D. So if you're seeing things and you say, this is factual evidence, then that words go into the 4D, into the spiritual dimension and shift the facts. The word of God is the truth. And what happens with the truth is truth is a higher reality than facts. Because facts can be subject to change. They just need something more powerful to change them. So we see with Jesus, he demonstrated this. He comes to the disciples walking on the water. The disciples are spooked. They say, ah, it's a ghost. So wait a minute. This is Jesus? And then Peter says, Jesus, if, if that's really you, Tell me to come to you walking on the water. And what did Jesus say? Okay, come. And what did he do? Peter, who was not a theologian, didn't go to Bible school, was not saved and, and taught the word of faith, was not taught the Bible. I mean, he, he didn't know a whole lot about anything. He'd just been following Jesus. And yet... He was able to defy the law of gravity. He gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. He starts doing the same thing Jesus does, and now he's defying space and matter. How? One word, come. So that word gave him the empowerment to do something supernatural whether it's shifting molecules or maybe he became weightless in that moment. I don't know. When I get to heaven, I got a lot of questions. Yeah. I'm like, how did this happen? Like, God, I know what happened. I believe by faith, I know. But like, how did, how did you make it happen? But yet, Jesus spoke those words and he had 
uh, authority over the 3D realm. And so how do you fill this container? Or how do you know what's going to come out of these containers? Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, it says this. Brood of vipers. And I'm going to read uh, Matthew 12, 34 through 37. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The message version says it like this, and I'll pick up in verse 36. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Hopefully this is helping you tonight. It says this, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it, Spring the issues of life. That word issues doesn't mean like problems. It means borders or boundaries. The New Living Translation gives us a different degree of clarity. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Say, guard your heart. Turn to your neighbor. Say, guard your heart. Turn to your other neighbor, the good-looking one. Say, guard your heart. Married men, just continue to look at your wife. Guard your heart. Why do we want to guard our heart? Because what's in our heart will soon come out of our mouths. The Bible even talks about our thinking. And in Proverbs, there's a scripture that says, if you've thought an evil thought, put your hand over your mouth. Why? Because the temptation is once you think it, you'll say it. Guard your heart. Because words are containers of creation. There's a story about the famous Zig Ziglar, who's an international speaker, motivational, uh, inspirational speaker. And he tells a story about going to New York City, and he was on his way to the subway, and he passed a beggar who was begging for money. And he wasn't just begging for money. He was selling uh, pencils, regular pencils for a dollar. And so he was selling these pencils, and Zig Ziglar, you know, he walked by and just dropped a dollar in the bucket. He didn't eat the pencil, and he just kept walking off. And something inside of him told him to stop, go back and get the pencil. So he said, okay, walk back. And he said, I'd like my pencil, please. The beggar looked at him and said, okay, here you go. And he took the pencil, and when he looked at him, he said, You're a businessman, like me. You're no longer a beggar. These simple words resonated heavy inside of that former beggar's heart. He actually began to say over and over again, all that day, I'm not a beggar. I'm a businessman, a businessman who sells pencils. And what happened was that day, his self-portrait changed. And some time later, perhaps even some years later, that man became a very successful businessman. And he wanted to go back and tell Zig Ziglar his story. And so he went to one of his meetings and said, hey, I want to tell you about what you did to me and for me. He said, I always thought of myself as a beggar. But the day you called me a businessman, like you, those words changed my life forever. Those words created a new self-image. See, words are so powerful that they won't just create outside of you, they'll also create inside of you. And we can actually see this in the scriptures because Abraham exercised this principle. Romans chapter 4 and verse 19. Go to Romans chapter 4 and verse 19. I'm going to read through verse 21. Romans 4, 19, it says this. And not being weak in faith, 
He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Say strengthened in faith. Giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So notice it said that Abraham was strengthened in faith. Okay, put a check right there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Hebrews 11, 11. It says this. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she also bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So we see Abraham was strengthened in faith. We see Sarah had to receive strength to conceive. So that tells me if she had to receive it, she didn't formally have it. So how did this transference of strength occur? Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5. And to catch you up to speed, give you a little context. So here Abraham is, 99 years old, almost 100 years old, and God had promised him 24 years ago that he would have a promised son by himself and his wife, Sarah. But yet, they had not had a son together. Now, they did have one son, but it wasn't Sarah's son, Abraham decided, and and Sarah and Abraham decided that he should get with their handmaiden, Hagar, with their servant, and come together and conceive because they were going to try to use their own human effort to bring to pass God's promises. But God reminded them and said, no, 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 no. There's, There's no human effort here in my promise. You have to believe and trust me. And so that wasn't the promised son. So now God is reminding him, hey, this promise still stands. I want to use you to be a blessing. You're going to uh, um, uh, be a mighty nation, and many are going to come from you. You're going to have descendants that are like numbers of the, the stars of the sky. And so he's reminding him in Genesis chapter 17, the promise has not been fulfilled. But, God bless you, he gives him the strategy. In verse 5, he says, no longer shall your name be called Abram. And that word Abram, it means high father. But your name shall be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. For I have made you a father of many nations. Then skip down to verse 15 of Genesis chapter 17. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, and that's his wife, Sarai means my princess, because remember, she didn't have any kids. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and I will also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come and be from her. So check this out. So God speaking to Abraham, or Abram in the prayer closet, says, Abram, I want to change your name. No longer will your name be Abram. It's going to be Abraham. And so Abram has to receive this instruction. Says, okay, all right, all right, right, God. Well, I mean, if that's what you say, you know, I've been rocking with you for this long. Okay, let's do it. But it's easy to say yes to God in that moment, in the prayer closet, at the altar, Caleb's playing, the music is going, you got the worship team. It's easy to say yes to God here, but what happens the next morning and the next day and then after the weekend's over and and then the next week? Because Abram had to get up from that moment and then he had to go face the world and the moment he saw his servant, his servant said, hello, sir, Abraham, would you like some coffee this morning? And he had to say, Yes or no? I mean, you know, if he was smart, he said yes, right? Coffee's good. (laughs) And then he would say, well, my name is Abraham now. So now he's having to correct people and instruct people to participate in the renaming that God is just giving him. So he says, well, my name is Abraham now. Like, oh, okay, Abraham. And back then, people knew what names meant. It wasn't a secret. They knew what that name meant. They knew that they were now calling him a father of many nations. 
But it's not just that. Now he has to maybe go to the workplace. Maybe he goes to school. Maybe he's going back to school to get his degree. I don't know. And now he's instructing those around him to call him Abraham. And now he's going to hang out and watch the rugby game with the springbacks. He's like, hey, guys, what's up? What's up, Nick? Hey, Abram, what's up? Abram, what's going on? He said, what's going on? Well, actually, as a matter of fact, it's Abraham now. He said, Abraham? Boy, get out of here, Abraham. He said, Abraham? Who do you think he is? (laughs) Okay, Abraham. And yet he has to live this reality, though. Not just for a day or two or three. Now this is his reality. But that's not even the worst part. Because I've been married for 16 years, love my wife Nikki, and I can only imagine having to go through this scenario because he not only has to have his own name changed, he has to go to his wife who has been barren all her life, never had kids, and now she's 90 years old. She definitely ain't having no kids. The shop is closed. And yet he has to go to her and tell her that God has renamed you Sarah, mother of nations. And I can only imagine her saying, Abram. (laughs) Oh, my fault, Abraham. We've been over this, darling. You know my status. Like, why are we making this difficult for ourselves? No, no, we just got to trust God. Sarah, okay, just, 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 just say it, okay? <sighs> All right, Sarah. So now she has to go through the same process. She wasn't even the one who heard from God. So now she has to be submissive to her husband who has renamed her something that makes her feel even more embarrassed about her barrenness. Yeah. Are you willing to say what God says? And so now... She has to go through life and correct people. She's got to correct her servants. Oh, it's Sarah now. She goes to the hairdresser because she likes to keep it tight and gets her hair done. And they say, oh, hey, girl, what's up, Sarah? And she says, well, actually, it's Sarah now. <laughs> like, what you talking about, Sarah? We know what your name is. No, it's Sarah. Sarah. So she's going through all of this, and oftentimes when God is doing something in our lives, he's elevating us, he will require our speech to change. Because remember what we said, your life will either rise or fall to the level of your speech. And when God is trying to elevate you, it also takes a different frequency of what you're proclaiming. And so, now what happens? In verse 21, God tells Sarah, or God tells Abraham, excuse me, in that same moment, God tells Abraham, this time next year, your wife, not just you, your wife and you will bear a son. So, you know, this time next year could represent around 12 months. How long does it take for a baby to come and grow full term? Nine months, right? So what's the math? 12 minus nine is three. So we got three months. So if you're following with me, so God tells them this, you're going to have a child in, let's say, 12 months. Now you got to tell your wife because she has to conceive, but she can't conceive right now. But they have three months to get themselves and others to participate in speaking words of faith that will do surgery on their bodies that they didn't even have technology for. And as they spoke those words, they said those names over and over and over. They didn't just say it one day, two days, three days, three months. Three months. So over a series of days and months, now their bodies received strength to conceive. Because it's not just about what you'll say one time. It's also about what you'll keep saying, what you'll keep decreeing over your life, the words you keep releasing out of your mouth. And we see she did receive strength to conceive. Abraham received that strength. Because, you know, when they had Isaac, it wasn't like an immaculate conception thing, you know, like with Mary. Like it's what I call traditional conception. And so everything had to work right. But, uh, but God's promise was fulfilled. And it reminds me 
of the woman with the issue of blood. In Mark chapter 5, we see this woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says that she had spent everything that she had to get better, but did not grow better, but rather grew worse. And as she's spending everything she had, she now grew worse. She was out of money. She was out of resources. She was out of ideas. She was out of doctors. She was out of options. And I want you to go to Mark chapter 5 and verse 28. Then the word of the Lord hits her. And it says, for she said, I believe God quickened her. For she said, if I, or if only I, may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. No, you can keep 28 up there. If I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. It says she said it, but if you look up that Greek word for said, it's lego. And it actually translates to keep saying over and over and over again. So imagine her in her bedroom. She said, if I may just touch his clothes, I can be made well. If I can touch his clothes, I can be made well. That's crazy. If I can touch his clothes, I can be made well. Well, I don't have any more options. If I can touch his clothes, I can be made well. And she said, well, what am I talking about? If I go outside, I'm going to break the law because according to Jewish law, because she had that condition, she could be stoned to death rightfully because she left the home. So what is happening inside of her? She's having this tension because she's hearing what her spirit is saying, but yet she knows naturally her her, her wellness is at risk. Her life is at risk if she leaves that door. But yet she keeps saying it and saying it. And I believe this boldness, this might, this spirit of faith starts rising up inside of her. And she says, you know what? I don't care what happens. As a matter of fact, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to make it to the master. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. I'm going to be made whole. So now she's going and going, and she sees Jesus, and she's making her way through the crowd and finally gets a chance to get close enough to touch him. And Jesus, immediately knowing that power had gone out of him because the Bible says she was immediately healed from her condition. She didn't have to go through treatment. She was immediately healed. And Jesus stopped, and he said, who touched me? And I can imagine Peter, because he was the outspoken one. Jesus, bro, what you talking about, Jesus? I mean, like, the multitude is thronging you, bro. Like, he touched you, she touched you, she touched you. This little guy over here probably touched you. Like, they all touched you. What are you talking about? He said, no, no. Somebody touched me with an expectation. See, the words that you speak consistently, strategically create an expectation in your spirit, and it allows you to touch God, to receive from God, to touch heaven. What are you saying out of your mouth? And what did he say to her? He said, it's okay, daughter. Go and be healed of your plague. And in that moment, we saw something beautiful happen that because she decided to partner with God with her words, she was healed of her condition. It led me to the question, Pastor, how much does God want to do in our lives that we may be shrinking down or preventing simply because the words that we're speaking aren't big enough? or the way that we're talking aren't agreeing with God on the frequency and level that we need to agree with him. What if we agreed with the word of God and agreed with God at the level that we can truly see him do supernatural things in our lives and through our lives over and over and over and over? And I believe a lot of you all probably have a testimony about God doing something major in your life. But it doesn't have to just be that one time. Because God wants to use you to be a walking showpiece for him. He wants to use your life to be a billboard for him, to be an open display of God's goodness that this is what the kingdom of God is like. Prosperity and peace and joy and hope 
and love and fulfillment and destiny and prosperity and favor and power and wisdom. He wants to show you off as his child that represents the kingdom of God the right way. But in order to represent the kingdom of God the right way, we have to have the right speech of the government of the kingdom of God. We have to say what God says. So I came all the way from Chicago to encourage you with this one simple message. Here is my plea to you, my request of you. Agree with God. Be like Abram, who is now Abraham, the father of our faith, and agree with God. What is it in your life that you might have stopped agreeing with God about? Not because you think God can't do it, but your words aren't lining up with the thing that you say you believe. What is it that God wants to do in your life that God is waiting on your authorization by what you say? Or maybe there's some maintenance, there's some cleanup that needs to happen because maybe you've gotten a little too relaxed by what's coming out and you're starting to connect some dots, draw some lines and understand, oh, I see what might have been happening. Now, if this is you, this is not a speech or a message of condemnation because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But God sent me all the way here from Chicago to fly many, many hours just to tell you that if you agree with God, you can never go wrong. Thanks for watching. We trust this word takes root in your heart. To stay in touch, visit the website linked below. We'd love to have you join in person soon. Be sure to visit us in Durban, South Africa or Charleston, USA. Have a blessed week.